It's our prospect episode. We've got FSWA Baseball Writer of the Year, Eric Cross, here to navigate us through the strategy of using prospects in fantasy and a ton of information about the rookies who you should know about for this year and for next. A jam-packed episode of Beat the Shift is next. Welcome to another episode of the Beat the Shift Podcast, presented by Fangraphs. I am your host, Ariel Cohen, and with me, as always, is Ruven Guy. How are you, Ruven? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Oh, man, I still can't get my voice 100% right after all the softball playing. Uh, but softball's going well. Otherwise, how are you, Ruven? I'm doing great. Can't complain, except for the fact that I'm, I'm a Mets fan, and they're on the West Coast, and I'm staying up all night to watch the games. Did you see how much of that game the other night did you see the 13-12 game and at what point did you say that's it? I said that's it at 1:37 Eastern Standard Time when the game wow. ended. Wow, you saw the whole thing. I, I saw the entire thing. It was it was a great game. It was so back and forth. But I, I, the problem is I I mean personally I think the issue was Edwin Diaz and his issue is that if he doesn't pitch a couple days in a row or he misses and doesn't pitch for three or four days in a row, his command is all over the place and he's not the same pitcher. So I think if he needs to have more pitching and can get more reps in order to be better. Yeah. For me, I, uh, you know, I, I followed the game on the way to my playing softball. That's where I was losing, so I didn't really think much of it. Played the game, and you, then you turn on the radio going home, and— well, the Mets are about to tie it. Whoa! And then I get home, and now the Mets are up, and I'm watching the rest of the game. I watched the rest of the game on TV, which was uh, definitely a thriller. All right. Anyways, we've got a great show today. Uh, it's our prospect show. Uh, as you know, uh, Ruben and I, and especially me, I'm not a prospect person. Um, you know, that's one hole in my fantasy baseball game. Uh, comes from the fact that I don't have that much time on my hands to really dive in, although it's a great skill to know how to do, and certainly those who play Dynasty uh, Keeper Leagues really do need to know. And, of course, we all need to know, especially the prospects that are coming up this year or high prospects that are going to come up next year. So uh, we have a fantastic guest on our show today. His name is Eric Cross. He writes over at Fantrax. By the way, he was the Baseball Writer of the Year last year, so... First of all, a big congratulations to you on that, Eric, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. I always look forward to uh, talking baseball with you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. So uh, let's start right away with our strategy section. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, you know the prospects, you know, you know the guys coming up. How important do you think it is for the average fantasy player, the ones that are playing redraft leagues, right, so not the keeper leagues, how important is it to know the, the, the guys that are coming up, the top prospects? Uh, and do you think that it differs for pitchers versus hitters? I'll say I'll say moderately. Uh, it's a, like, you need to have some knowledge, I think. But it's, it's not a deal breaker, right? Like You can be highly successful. You can win leagues without even touching a prospect during the season. We've seen it plenty of times. Some some players just don't want to go after prospects because of, especially in weekly fab, where usually the the bigger names all go for you know twenty, thirty, forty percent of budget. So maybe you don't want to spend all that, especially with all the unknowns. But we've seen some of the even the biggest names come up and falter. And I got to go back to former Mets prospect and you know my boy Jared Kalanick. We've seen all that worked out. So. Yeah, so but I would say you need to have at least some knowledge because sometimes you can get these these guys for a pretty even some of the bigger names sometimes go under the radar. Like for instance, uh, a few weeks ago when Royce Lewis came up, you know he was a former number one overall pick handful of years back and kind of had some down years, missed a year with injury, but was performing very well. Came up and I think in the uh, tag team league that uh, I co-managed with Michael Govier from Palazzo Podcast. We got him for like forty or something dollars, so that's pretty reasonable price tag. So uh, you know, you never know. Always throw a bid in. Obviously, you never know, right? You know, um, so so I think you need to have some knowledge because these guys can definitely make a big impact when it comes to hitters versus pitchers. I always lean a little bit to the hitting side of things that so we've seen for the most part. Pitchers take a little bit longer 
to kind of get their you know, get their footing and settle in. Even the top guys, you know, like George Kirby had a great first start, but he's kind of been up and down ever since in the last three. So usually the bigger impact right away, or at least the potential for it, uh, usually comes from the hitter. So that's why I usually lean a little more heavy. If I do bet on prospects, I'll lean a little more heavy on uh, hitters than pitchers. Do you think it's more important to know about the prospects pre-draft or during the season? Uh, probably during the season, um, especially the bigger names. Like, I don't think you really need to go too deep into it because the top, you know, some of like those pop up guys that weren't like big prospect names. Like the first example that comes to mind is uh, Chase Silseth out with the Angels. How he was kind of off the radar altogether coming into the year, but had a great year in the upper minors. Came up and you know, if anybody was bidding on him, it wasn't a lot. So I think so. Um, definitely knowing what they're doing in season. But then again, I don't think you need to necessarily know the deeper names because usually those guys are, you know, usually don't get bid on until you see a couple starts. And then, like, all right, maybe I'll start bidding on this guy. But definitely, I think the top guys for sure. Yeah. I think role is always the key. I think that for hitters, those who get regular at bats with good lineup spots are, you know, very, very uh, important to follow right away. Mm -hmm. um, it also depends on the position. I mean, if, if players are fantastic fielders, a great fielding shortstop, fantastic fielding outfielder, the defense is going to keep them in the majors, even if they falter a little bit, you know, in the get-go. Uh, catchers generally fail um, in terms of prospecthood uh, as they are learning the defense. Let's see what happens with Adley Rutschman, who's, you know, possibly different than everybody else. You can tell me otherwise, Eric. Um, uh, pitchers, as you say, um, you know, you, you're going to get these ups and downs. Uh, you rarely see a pitcher who just comes and just mows them down n night after night after night and doesn't hit a wall. I'll, even though I, I, I've seen pitchers come and first two, three starts, fantastic, then they hit a wall. And if you're playing in a roto league, they sometimes give back all of their ratios, right? I, 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 can, use, I can use prospect rookies pitchers for head-to-head -head leagues in certain weeks right away, and then sometimes uh, you, know, you can throw them away, whereas roto – if you play them in the wrong start, they just give it back because of the up and down nature of being a prospect there. Uh, that's that's sort of what I see. I'd say that hitters in a roto league, a lot of the possible value comes from speed. So prospects who do give speed as part of their game usually are more stable and uh, have a higher probability of gaining their value. So, uh, I mean, look, look at Julio Rodriguez this year. Look at that stolen base value. So even if... He wasn't hitting any homers or he wasn't hitting okay. The stolen bases keep you up. So I, it is important to, to know about the prospects, but I think you got to dive into role and the type of value they will put up before you go and jump in the deep end uh, to get them. W would you agree with that, Eric? Absolutely would. And that's why I even mentioned I actually wrote up a uh, article earlier this week about – uh, the new kind of the, my top 10 prospects to stash right now, since we've had a lot of promotions and, and whatnot over the last few weeks. So I thought it would be good to update that list. And that's one thing I mentioned right in the intro was, you know, this, the list was a combination of obviously talents, but you know, the potential for everyday playing time has to be there. And a good example is MJ Melendez. When he came up, you know, he was coming off the huge year last year, hit 41 home runs in the minors. But he came up and, you know, they needed him because uh, Cam Gallagher, their backup catcher in Kansas City, went on the IL. So they needed him. But right away, like, he was only starting, like, you know, three, four times a week. And that's hard to, to roster outside of deep, deeper leagues. So but obviously now he's uh, he's getting it going with Sal Perez on the IL. He's getting a lot more playing time. But, yeah, the fact that he was, all right, he's a sexy call-up. But how often is he going to play? And is he going to play enough to make that impact? So, yeah, absolutely roll 100% plays into it. I think I think also the matters what team they're on because they have to know uh, who, where they're located on the on the totem pole for each team because if they're blocked in a certain position they'll have to learn a new position and sometimes they don't take to it that well or they're not happy with it and their offense may suffer. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, hundred percent, and we've seen that a lot more recently. And and yeah, baseball players have gotten more versatile than they used to. Like I remember, you know, I remember back when I first started playing fantasy baseball. You know, the, there were some multi-position guys, but not a lot, right? Now we see it so often with all these guys have two, three, four positions that are eligible at. And some of the prospects as well, like Royce Lewis is good, a good example of that. Shortstop by by uh, nature, but also has played some second, some third, some center field as well. But, you know, he got sent back down when Correa came back from the IL. So, 
Yeah, especially when, when you have a, a big name guy like Correa who might only be there this year, but still that affects us this year. We're talking about redraft, not long term in dynasty. So you, you have to having that you know versatility is huge. Where you know Lewis, though he did get sent back down, probably could come back up pretty soon because like I said he can play those other positions. That that definitely helps. Yeah, I I, I normally don't want to get sidetracked on on the strategy element, but since you mentioned Lewis. Well, do you know or suspect what Minnesota's plan is with where he's playing? Because obviously they signed Correa, and that's his primary position. Is it Minnesota's intention to play him elsewhere, or is it Minnesota's intention to maybe showcase him at at shortstop primarily? You know, more practice at that at the minors, coming up replacing uh, Correa as he's injured um, to showcase him for a possible trade, or are they going to find a permanent spot for him? Like, what what do you suspect the plan is for him? That's a great question, and that's one I've kind of been asking myself as well. You know, I think their long-term, obviously this is all pure speculation, but I do think their long-term plan is to have him as their shortstop. I think they kind of had a feeling that when they did sign Carlos Correa that he was going to, you know, use that opt-out and go get another a bigger deal next year. So with that in mind, you know, maybe only he's only around for this year. And I, and I don't think when they signed Correa, I'm not sure they thought that Royce Lewis was going to bounce back to the degree he did, right? Like he, he He's hinted at it, you know, last year he had some decent metrics and all, looked good in workouts and whatnot, looked good in spring training, but I don't think they thought he'd bounce back to being like you know, even better than he was back when he, you know, was the number one overall draft pick a handful of years ago. So I think they kind of threw a monkey wrench into their plans where they're like, well, shoot, now we gotta, you know, find room for this guy. So, I think for this year, they will find room for him. Uh, if I had to venture a guess, maybe I'll say third base. or, But I got he could play second base as well. Probably one of those two spots as opposed to the outfield. He has the least amount of time there. But then I think long term, you know, Correa probably leaves after this year. And then Royce Lewis can slide back over to shortstop where he's most comfortable. All right. So the, the big fantasy question, and I'd say the big baseball question about prospects are, as Jerry DePoto said the other day, that you know he thinks the fact that the minor leagues didn't play in 2020, you know, just completely stunted a lot of growth for some of these prospects. Look at Jared Kelenic, who looks like he's far behind in his development, uh, and he's not where he should be at this point. Uh, a, do you agree with that assertion that that missing that year was humongous and that's affecting the whole class of prospects coming up now? And B, does that mean in fantasy baseball as an actual point for us fantasy owners to stay away from a lot of these fan these prospects coming up this year, I think it absolutely played into it. And I was fortunate enough to interview several prospects at various points during the uh, the pandemic. I interviewed a few of them back right when it was you know early to mid twenty twenty, like first couple of months of the pandemic, and then I, I've interviewed some as recently as a couple of months ago. And you know, including a couple of big, I interviewed Shane. The two biggest names are Shane Boz and Robert Hassel that I interviewed. Boz was back earlier on, Hassel more recently, and they all kind of echoed similar sentiments that yeah, it was difficult. Even even the guys that were getting the the reps at the you know the alt sites, the guys that are on on the forty man or whatever they the how many players are allowing there, even that was difficult because. Yeah, it was some sim games and whatnot, but you weren't getting like the actual full game action. And some of the other guys, like the the younger guys that didn't get, um, didn't have that luxury of being at the alt site. They were just trying to find, you know, going back to their hometown and going to their, you know, their local high school field or the, the local gym, whatever it may be, just to get get some reps in and stay fresh. So, just throwing, you know, and we, as we know, baseball players are creatures of habit, right? So just throwing off that, you know, the work ethic and. You know, all of that, it, it, I think it did affect. And I'm not saying that's 100% the reason for Jared Kelnick's struggles, but you got to wonder if, you know, perfect world, we'd ever had this whole COVID pandemic and we had a normal minor league season in 2020 where Kelnick could have, you know, been in double A, got some triple A time, kind of had that more natural progression up the ladder. If he would have had the same level of struggles, I gotta think no. Maybe obviously, maybe he still wouldn't have been as good as we thought right now, but maybe not quite as bad as we thought either. Because he, he kind of got had to get rushed. You know, he played like six games at AAA last year before they initially brought him up. So I 100% do believe that it did play a factor. And moving forward, I think it's 
as we get further and further removed from that lost 2020 season, I think it plays less of, of a factor because, you know, the people still, the, all these prospects still had that full year last year to kind of get back into the normal swing of things. So uh, I, I think I, that will affect these guys less and less as we move forward. Ruvain, it's obviously a case by case basis, but are you staying away from prospect pickups this year? I'm only staying away because of the prices that they're going for because <laughs> we're paying for their minor league stats and some of them are incomplete minor league stats. I want to pay for something that I know I'm going to get. I want to get a known commodity more so. There are some prospects that I'm willing to go after, like the higher, higher, the top ones, but I'm not willing to pay what other people are willing to pay because I have holes in my lineup. This is for in a redraft league. I have holes in my lineup that they can fill, but I don't know if I want to go jump and fill them with a prospect that I don't know what I'm going to get as opposed to a guy who I know... I in that stats may not be great, but you know, he may not he's not gonna fizzle out or be even sent back down. All right. So before we throw out a couple of specific names to talk about with you, Eric, um, can you tell us uh who are just for our for our audience here, who are some of the top prospects in baseball and what their ETA is, uh, as well as some of the prospects who can really make the biggest impact in twenty twenty two for your fantasy leagues? Yeah, I'll just go right down uh, my top 10 here. Number one, I have Corbin Carroll, who's in double-A right now for the Arizona Diamondbacks, outfield prospect who is absolutely tearing it up there. He's he's performing like Trey Turner. Obviously, it's double-A, but he, he's a guy that has has the elite context. He's a leadoff hitter type of guy. can get on base at a really high clip, double-plus speed. He could be a 30-plus stolen base guy, and, and the power's come along this year as well. I think he's the only project in the minors that has double-digit home runs and steals so far. Uh, he's probably I've, – I've had this question asked if he's going to be up this year. I With Arizona not contending, I highly doubt it. But, you know, maybe around this time next year, like a, a May 2023 debut, I think it's definitely possible. Uh, next in the list, Robert Hassel the third, uh, who's one I got to interview a handful of months back, outfield project for the San Diego Padres. Uh, he's in high A right now. Uh, kind of similar to Carroll, the, the power hasn't quite materialized as much as Carroll, but this is as a is a high upside guy as well. He's probably a little bit behind, but I can see a um, mid summer debut next year for Hassel. You know, we've seen San Diego has been one of the more aggressive teams with their prospect promotion, so I think he could be up pretty soon. Uh, Riley Green's next, and he would have been up now if he didn't have the foot injury. He's probably back up in. You know, probably June. He probably needs a few weeks of rehab game. So mid to late June, I think we could see Riley Green. C.J. Abrams, I think, is back up again. Similar timeline to Green, maybe another month or so once he starts heating up in AAA. Obviously, the the first stint for him with San Diego didn't go quite as planned, but he got rushed. I didn't think he was ready, so I'm not overly surprised to see him struggle in the major league level. Uh, and then Adley Rushman is already up, and we already talked about him. Uh, next, Grayson Rodriguez, who is my top pitching prospect in all of the minor leagues. He should be up very soon. There was a lot of rumblings that they wanted to bring him and Adley up right around the same time. And obviously, Adley was came up this past weekend. So I think by within the next two weeks, if I'd venture a guess on Grayson Rodriguez, and he's one of those arms that could make an immediate impact. Uh, next couple, next uh, two, just round up top 10. I got Noel V. Marte who's a shortstop prospect for Seattle, really had a, a breakout year last year, but it's kind of scuffled this year, but still has high upside, probably a mid to late 2023 ETI in him. And then Jordan Walker, third base prospect for the St. Louis Cardinals, who is big time power, a little bit of speed and has shown some improvements as a pure hitter. He's probably late 2023 or so, um, but he's could be you know a good time, uh, excuse me, a big time third baseman as well yeah a lot of these guys though are are in double a or single a although they're, they're fantastically high upside uh maybe uh, do you have a couple of other names who might help fantasy owners in 2022 for you know coming up either super two right now or you know the august september call-ups yeah for sure uh the first two names that immediately outside of royce lewis obviously uh but i'll go some results here uh tristan Cassis from the boston red sox he is on the IL right now, doing a little bit of an ankle injury, but should be back within the next week or so from the sounds of it around the team. And with Bobby Dahlbeck struggling mightily this year, and I don't think Franchi Cordero is the answer as well, Christian Casas is their long-term first baseman, first baseman in the future. So he's probably up within the next, uh, hopefully when he comes back from injury, 
gets off, you know, maybe another couple weeks in AAA, he's probably up by the All Star break. And then a guy that I should be up any day now, if Kansas City will actually do it, that's the question. Vinny Pasquantino. Everyone's been looking at Nick Prado, but Pasquantino is a simply the better hitter. Yeah, Prado has the edge defensively, which definitely does play in. So he may, might be the one that gets the call first. But Pasquantino is absolutely mashing down in AAA. He actually just had a uh, five-hit, two-double, two-home run game yesterday. Uh, he's hitting for high average, high OBP. He's a rare slugger that, like, the K rate for him is, you know, like 13%, and he walks about as much as he strikes out. So one of those rare slugging first basemen that actually keep the K rate very low, almost like Freddie Freeman as. I'm not saying he's Freddie Freeman good, but kind of that, that way with the approach. So he should be up. Like I said, he's ready right now. It's just a matter of matter of when they call him up. And, and just one more name just to throw out there. Um, another name that I really like is Miguel Vargas out with the Dodgers. Uh, he can play both corner spots. Obviously, the Dodgers, just, it's hard to break into that lineup. But he's a guy that is always hit for a high average. He's over 300 in the minor leagues. You know, he's like a 20, 25 homer type of guy. That adds a little bit of speed as well. He's really heated up over the last month after a uh, slower you know, April. He's really turned it on in May. So maybe, you know, injury from one of the corner guys or, you know, Turner struggle, keep struggling, whatever it might be. So he's, I think he's next on, next one up for in terms of at bats there, just a matter of uh, getting that spot. But he could have definitely be a nice impact bat as well for this year. Well, fantastic rundown of that. And before we go further, with any other names of prospects, it's time for the Injury Gurus Trivia of the Week. Well, Eric, you actually mentioned the guy I wanted to talk about a little bit about trivia today, and that is Tristan Cassis. We actually saw him in the Arizona Fall League this past fall in Arizona, obviously, for the name. <laughs> and he is a big guy. He is really big, and he has a lot of power. So my question for you is this. Since you're from the Northeast and since you are a Red Sox fan, last year, Carl Schwarber had the highest war for any first baseman for the Red Sox last year at 1.2. Who was the last Red Sox first baseman to have a war higher than 1.5 in a full season? Ooh, that is a good question. I'm going to assume David Ortiz and his 10 starts a year doesn't count. So, uh, ooh, that is a good question. Is it can I, is it this uh, century? It is this century, yes. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> yes, right. I, I, just want, I just want to know how far back I need to go. Uh, I, I don't know if this is – I'm probably forgetting a name more recently, but I'll go Kevin Euclid. Wow, that's really far back. That's that's not the answer. Ariel, do you have any guess? First baseman, Red Sox. Thinking more of one of the one of the guys who won the World Series a couple of years back. Uh, it's, it's I, I, I can't come up with a name. Now, I'm not counting um, 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 Pierce, the guy who played first base for the Red Sox during one of their runs, because um, yeah. he was he was a platoon guy i mean he had a war 1.5 the year he did really well but hanley ramirez in 2016 had a war of 3.1 that was the last red Sox to have a war of over one and a half at first base for a full season and beyond that you're talking about mike napoli at 2.1 so you have to go really far back to get a someone who's actually had shown some skills and show them on the field with power and everything like that for the Red Sox, so Tristan Cassis, he has nobody blocking him. I mean, Bobby yeah. Dahlbeck, he they're trying him everywhere. They're trying him at first base, they're trying him at third because that's their, you know, they got nothing else to do. And if you go to roster resources on Fangraphs right now, the starting first baseman, like you mentioned, is Franchi Cordero. I mean, come on, Franchi Cordero, first baseman. No, no, this is it's <laughs> it, Tristan Tristan Cassis. Once he gets, he's he has an ankle injury, and and you mentioned about that, he should be back in about two or three weeks. And after that, if he does well and the Red Sox start going downhill it's very possible he gets called up even um right after the all-star break I can see that happening what do you think about that yeah for sure and he hopefully he bucks that trend right and I totally forgot I kind of forget the uh the tail end of Hanley's tenure here because it was it was a nightmare after those first couple good years he had but totally forgot he went over to first base for a bit because he couldn't play shortstop anymore but, yeah, no, Cassis, definitely. I saw Cassis a bunch last year when he was up in AA, which is the AA park for Boston is 15, 20 minutes from my house. So I get I catch a lot of games there. And he is just a great 
pure hitter, you know, high, you know, good average, high OBP, low strikeout rate type. And last year, he even mentioned that he wasn't really focused on hitting for power. And I think we won't even mention how big he is. I think he's like 6'4", 250, something like that. He has huge, huge power potential. And this year, he was, it was in an interview before the season. He's like, all right, I'm going to start trying to kind of tap into that power more. So I think he had like six home runs in 20-something games. So he, he was starting to hit for more power this year. I think he had 14 last year in 100 and whatever games. But yeah, definitely he's the most excited I've been about a Red Sox hitting prospect since, you know, Devers. It's been a few years. So love the potential there. And yeah, I definitely think, like you said, the – the the hole is open. It's a gaping hole at first base, and hopefully he can plug that. Yeah, and I think he's gonna be a high floor guy because uh, right now this year he's hit. He has a fifteen percent walk rate in AAA and a twenty two percent strikeout rate. That usually will bode well uh, for mm-hmm. uh, contact and on base uh, in the majors. So uh, definitely good upside and uh, good for you, the Red Sox fan. There, right? <laughs> I'm I'm very excited. I've always been a big Cassis guy, so yeah, very very much looking forward to his debut. So uh, Ruben uh, threw, uh, threw me a couple names that he wanted to ask about. Uh, how about our Mets guy, uh, Brett, uh, Brett Beatty? Uh, also, uh, in the, uh, he was in the Arizona Fall League, which uh, I think we, we all saw together, right? We were all at first pitch Arizona, I believe, right? Yes, we had, that we were, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he had a great week uh, the week that we were there. Mets future third base. Right now, 114 WRC plus at double A. Probably will get up to AAA this year. I, I don't think we're going to see him this year. The Mets are really in a win-now mode. Uh, what are your thoughts about him, his ETA, and and uh, uh, what uh, he's capable of? I, I really like Beatty. You know, he's it's definitely there's a hole in his swing where he has a little bit too much swing and miss to his game. He chases a lot, kind of an aggressive guy. Though the walk rate is pretty solid as well. It's over 10% right now. Yeah, but he's a guy that I think he's going to hit for a solid average, you know, 270, 275 type of hitter. I think he's going to have a lot of doubles because he's got good power, but he, he's more of like a line drive kind of guy. He'll hit, he put a ton of balls in the gap. And when I saw him last year uh, in double A, earlier this year in double A, he had, I think, he had two or three doubles uh, in the two, three games I saw. Hit him hard, too. I think he had three batted balls that were above. 109 exit velo if I recall correctly including one that was like 115 or something like that so he hits the ball hard just not like some more of a line drive guy so I don't know if he'll ever be a huge you know 25 30 plus homer guy but maybe guy gets around 20 low 20s lots of doubles solid average if he can keep that K rate in check and yeah I think he's gonna be a guy that maybe he's not you know an all-star maybe that gets a couple all-star appearances in his career but I think he'll be like a solid above average regular uh, for the Mets. Yeah, I think next year. I think I think you get up to AAA probably sometime middle of this year, finish out the year there, and maybe he's up closer to, you know, this time next year, sometime in the summer. So, yeah, Beatty's a pretty solid hitter for sure. Yeah. Ruvain, any thoughts on our Met? Yeah, do you think he's going to have to change positions? Because the Mets have a lot of third-base options. They have J.D. Davis, who's under contract. They just signed Eduardo Escobar. They have McNeil, who can play third base. I mean, there's unless they move him around somewhere, I, I don't know where he's going to play this year or next year. And I think that may be a problem. I think that may they may end up keeping him in AAA all next year until either Escobar's contract expires or J.D. Davis's contract expires. No, absolutely they could. Yeah, they, they've kind of played it slow uh, with Brett Beard. He's still only 22 years old, too. Uh, but he has played some left field. That's the position he's played. And see, this year he's got uh, four starts there compared to the 27 at third base. Last year he got uh, eight, 18 starts at in left field compared to 65 at third base. So... Uh, he's played a little bit there, so that might be potentially where he ends up. Uh, he's a, he's a decent athlete as well. He's not, he doesn't have a lot of speed, but he's a solid enough athlete where I think he could transition out to the outfield and, and do fine out there. So maybe that's the other route they take and put him in left field. Thoughts on Edward Cabrera. He was up last year in the majors. Not so fantastic. 5 8 one ERA. Up and down this year, even at AAA. Uh, any thoughts about uh, the Marlin? Yeah. Cabrera is very, he's electric. Like he's one of the more electric arms in the minor leagues, but there's been some command issues there. It's it's always been pretty spotty. And the stuff is, is very good. Like this is stuff to be like a number three starter at the major leagues or high, maybe a number two, but I've always kind of had that, you know, the, the command is something I value so much uh, with pitching prospects as we've seen. I've seen some, some of the m- most talented arms just get ruined because of terrible command. 
First one comes to mind, Forrest Whitley. He was, was the number one pitching prospect for a couple of years, but his command along with injuries has really derailed his career. I and mean, there's a long laundry line of list of guys that you could say the same thing about. So Cabrera, I always wonder if he's going to be a guy that gives you a lot of strikeouts, but maybe the ratios aren't the best. Maybe he's more like a four, you know, low four ERA, one, three, one, four whip type of guy. So, you know, that's still obviously valuable when you, when you factor in the strikeouts for fantasy, but I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind that maybe he's not the best, you know, ratios guy, but uh, still strikeouts are, you know, valuable in fantasy for sure. So I think there's definitely a, uh, definitely a, a good chance he turns into a solid fantasy starter. Once Max Meyer gets over his elbow issue, the um, ulnar irritation, and he's already throwing off flat ground, so he's going to be over hopefully pretty soon. Who do you think is going to be called up first, Meyer or Cabrera? That's that's a tough one. They've kind of, kind of come back and forth. I I think it's going to be Cabrera. Meyer, you know, before he got hurt, he wasn't pitching well. Like his last, like he started off pitching very well this year, but then like the last, I think it was the last three outings or so. As I pull up his game log, yeah, oh, the last two outings uh, on the seventeenth, eight earned in three and a third, and on the twelfth, the start before that, six earned in five innings. Every start before that, he only had six earned runs allowed total in six starts before those last two. So, uh, in fact, with the little injuries had, like you mentioned, plus the fact that he wasn't pitching well in those last couple outings, I think they'll give him some time to get, kind of right the ship, get a couple starts under his belt. So, I do think Cabrera is up a little sooner than Meyer, but long term, t- uh, I think Meyer's the better arm. So uh, we have a ton of mailbag questions, as they knew Eric would be coming on uh, this week. So let's get to a bunch of them. Uh, Matt asks, who has the better dynasty outlook for possible fab targets this weekend? And I'll only keeper he's in. Uh, is it uh, Morell? Is it Chris Morell of Chicago or Cal Mitchell of Pittsburgh? You mentioned Mitchell, but uh, uh, Morell actually is up with the majors doing so uh, doing well so far. Eight games batting 296 with two homers so far. Uh, is there any of these guys who are worth adding to his active roster even for this year? Yeah, I definitely think there is. Um, I think I would go, I think both are, are solid options. In, I went, I'm not sure about 12 teamers, but if you're in like a 14 or 15 teamer, I think definitely both are solid options. I'd probably lean Morrell. He has a little bit of speed element to his game as well. And the fact that he could be a, a multi-position eligible guy, you know, pretty soon. It all depends on your on your league thresholds for games played. But they, he's already start, started games at second, short, and most recently he started in, in center field earlier today on on Thursday. So, uh, and it looks like he's at a start. Like there was worried that he might be as like a platoon guy, but he started each of the last four games, five of the last six against both lefties and righties. So I think I think he's going to play, especially if he's hitting well. And Mitchell's always been a, a solid bat, kind of like the it's like the, almost like the Pittsburgh Pirates mold where they have a lot of the solid bats, but they're just like the boring types, like the Brian Reynolds types, you know, like Brian Reynolds, oh, he's having a bad year, but, you know, good hitter, but not flashy for fantasy purposes. Kamich kind of fits that mold. Uh, so I think for fantasy, you get that little bit of speed with Morrell, get the, the middle infield eligibility. So I would lean, if you have to pick one, I'd go Christopher Morrell. Is that for is that for this year or keeper? Because for this year, I think Morel's only up because Madrigal's injured, Nico Horner's injured. I think he's like a place keeper right now. I, I think he will be probably sent back down. But Mitchell, there's no one blocking him. It's Pittsburgh. There's no one blocking him. So for this right. year alone, who would you take? I think I think still Morel. I think it's it's closer for this year for sure. But you know, Nico Horner did come back today, started at short, and they moved Morel to center field. So that kind of shows me that they are trying to keep Morello's bat in the lineup. And if he continues to hit, I think they might move him around, you know, get him some, you know, outfield work. You know, he can play, you know, he's, he's a good athlete, so he, he can play a little bit of outfield. You know, Rafael Ortega, I don't know, you know, he's currently platooning in center field. So maybe he gets some time in center field with, with Ortega, sometime at second and short. So I think that might be able to move him around enough to keep, keep him in the lineup. So I would still lean Morell, but it's definitely a little bit closer for, for this year. And we mentioned Roll. Do you see where he's batting in the lineup every day now? Yeah, he's been batting leadoff the last. Lead uh, yeah, the last three the last three games he's batting leadoff, and even that that, that Cubs lineup is uh, kind of sneaky. It could be sneaky good. Like Contreras is having a good year. Hap, we've seen have some good stretches. Suzuki was having a good year. Schwindel is heating up a little bit here the last few weeks. So that could be a, a solid enough lineup behind him too. 
Yeah. You're batting first. I mean, you're not there to fill a gap here. You, if mm-hmm. you're batting seventh, you're here to fill a gap for Horner and, and Madrigal. To me, if you're batting first, you're here to get the look. Uh, and certainly if he's hitting, he'll keep getting the look. So well, in the, I, I in the last Pirates game, Mitchell was batting between Brian Reynolds and Cabrian Hayes. He's batting second. So it's not like he's batting lower in the lineup either. So, I mean, sure, he has the sure, option. Sure, sure. He's he's up there also. He'll score you a lot of runs. Yeah, A couple of good options. Definitely both are for NL only leagues. Yeah, I, I would definitely take the shots on. Remember, NL only leagues and very deep leagues are more about the at-bats. Um, and if you see a guy leading well for batting second on a team, that's at bats, at bats, at bats. You're going to do better than a veteran who's batting eighth, right? Uh, so that that there you go. Uh, Ed asks back to the Pirates here. Do Pirates give Juan Bay a shot now? He's hitting it in Triple A. Well, he is hitting in Triple A. He's batting almost 300, four homers and 11 stolen bases. Um, do you think that they give him a shot now? I think they do, and I think he might be. You know, people aren't going to want to hear this, but I think he might be the one that gets called up sooner you know between him and o'neill cruz so obviously is the the bigger sexier name for fantasy that you know people were drafting i think i saw him his adp get up near 200 near the end of draft season obviously that hasn't worked out yet but bay not sexy for fantasy purposes at all but he's a guy that can provide that that quiet production because he's always hit for a good average. He steals right? also. He steals. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. He, he provides a good. He'll provide a good average, and he steals bases. He has eleven steals this year. He even has four home runs this year. So he's showing a little bit of pop. He had last year eight home runs, twenty steals. He's a career two ninety seven hitter. Uh, and you mentioned uh, that he's hitting two ninety four this year, three seventy six OBP. Doesn't strike out much at all. K rates uh, below twenty percent. Walks a little bit as well. K, uh, walk rate a little bit above ten percent uh, for his minor league career. So. Yeah, maybe he's not quite as appealing for fantasy as O'Neill Cruz, but Cruz is struggling right now. Yeah, I sort of have a couple little mini like three, four game hot streaks. I think Cruz, last time I checked, was hitting around the Mendoza line this year. One ninety nine. Yeah, there you go. Eighty five WRC plus. Yep. So he's still flirting with that Mendoza line. He's got a little bit of power and speed, and obviously he's the better bat long term for fantasy. But this year, with how each of these guys is performing, and I don't even who is the middle infield. Oh yeah. Oh, right. So right now. Yeah, according to the roster resource, Josh Van Meter is platooning with Diego Castillo, and that shortstop is Rodolfo Castro. Like, okay, so n- neither one of <laughs> any of those three are, you know, like, oh, blocking, you know, Jihuan Bay from coming up. And he can play a little bit of outfield, too. So uh, a couple of paths to him getting in the lineup. So, yeah, I, I got to think he gets a shot here within the next probably handful of weeks or so. And what about his future double play partner, Nick Rodriguez? When do you think he's going to be up? Probably next year. He's actually he struggled a a bit this year. He's a guy that I've always been pretty high on. He was obviously a high draft pick, and he's got the a good power with some speed as well. A solid hit tool, but the K rate's kind of gotten him. He's a little bit too free swinging in his approach. This year, he's got fifty five strikeouts in thirty eight games for a thirty three point three percent K rate, and this is in Double A Eastern League. Uh, which is the league that I get to see a lot. So hopefully I'll get to see him later in the year uh, if Altoona comes here to Portland, Maine. But, you know, I still got four home runs, four steals. That's, that's solid. But only hitting 244, though high walk rate kept the OBP up at 370. Um, but, yeah, I think he's a guy that's probably up next year. I, I still believe in him long term. I think he'll rate the ship here as the season progresses. Now, this is a cold-weather league. It's, it's a pitcher-friendly league as well. So I'm, I'm not really putting too much stock in there, though. That K rate, like I mentioned, does concern me a little bit. So he's got to keep that in check moving forward. But I think he's going to be a, a pretty solid fantasy bat. And probably, you know, maybe he gets up AAA later this year and then maybe like a mid-2023 debut for Nick Gonzalez. A bunch of other listeners ask about players we've already talked about. Finney asked about O'Neill Cruz that we've discussed. Apotheosis asked about Corbin Carroll and Robert Hassel. So we've covered that. Looks like our listeners are astute and they do know some of the top guys. Uh, let's do one or two more. Uh, CJ asks, Boz or G Rod rest of season? G Rod, who's he talking about? Great, that's Grayson Rodriguez. Grayson Rodriguez. Uh, All right, so, so many rods <laughs> here to, to remember. I, I think that's like you know, if your last name is Rodriguez, it's like the the yeah. nickname that's built in, right? Your first initial, and then your your the rod, A Rod, you know, J Rod for Julio Rodriguez. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. Everyone, everyone goes there. It's kind of funny. That is a phenomenal question. Let me just let me just say that. Yeah. So bravo to whoever brought that up. CJ, yeah, okay. Ooh, I, I love both these guys, and I'm 100 percent a believer in both. I think they both can be aces at the highest level. They're that good. 
I will lean towards Grayson Rodriguez for this year because I wonder, you know, Boz is on a rehab uh, stint right now. He's pr- probably back, you know, mid June, if I had to venture a guess. Obviously, I'm just guessing, but I wonder how much they limit him coming back. And obviously, you know, Baltimore could do that with Rodriguez as well. He hasn't even debuted yet. Boz does have a little bit of time, obviously, last year, but. He's the one, like, Rodriguez has always been a guy that can pitch deep in the game. He's gone five and six the last few outings in AAA. So I, I wonder if he gets even more innings. They're probably up or up and back around the same time, mid-June for both, if I had to guess. So I wonder if G-Rod just goes a bit deeper, a little bit more innings. I wonder if there's, like, those three, four-inning starts for Boz just to keep him, you know, fresh and ease him back into action. It's also Tampa, but, Tampa does yeah. Stupid things like that, right? Well, exactly. Not stupid, smart things, but doesn't help our <laughs> fantasy teams, right? Right. We don't like it for fantasy purposes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, I-, I think their stats, like their ratios, and you know, strikeouts could be pretty similar. But I think there's gonna be a little bit more volume out of Rodriguez. So I'll, I'll lean him for this year. All right. Here's a good strategy mailbag question. Bomo asks, "How quickly should we trust short sample size numbers from top prospects, either performing good or bad?" So I guess we're we're talking about you know they come to majors and either they hit the floor, or don't hit the floor, usually don't hit the floor. But you know what what do you do with the, any short sample size and how how quick do you make the decision to 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 cut to to, to leave? You know, how, how do you run this with prospects? It's a it, it's it's a you definitely want to treat prospects from um, from a fantasy ownership very different than the old boring veterans. Like for those of you who have Joey Votto on your team, you might want to give him a little bit more rope because he's Joey freaking Votto, and he always does this at the end of the year lately. <laughs> um, but what do you do with these uh, short samples for the prospects there? Yeah, and Votto's even, he's got, gotten it going here right lately, so. Um... Yeah, it, it's such a hard question to answer with the prospects. I think it's really a case by case basis, but the ones that I tend to give a bit longer of, of a leash to, so to speak, are the ones that have shown consistently the ability to hit for a high average, that have shown a good approach at the plate, you know, good walk rates, keeping the strikeout rate low. Those are the guys that I, I think have a, a easier transition from the minor leagues to the major leagues. And it's not easy in general, but those guys that have shown that, you know, when they're up at the plate, they're in control of, the, of their bats. They don't, you know, chase at a high rate. They can get on base at a good clip. So those are the guys that I'll give a little bit longer of a leash to, but it's it's just really a hard answer uh, question to answer. So like I said, it is definitely case by case, but sometimes you look at, you know, thankfully we have all these great metrics at our disposal, both on fan graphs and, baseball savant and so on so brooks baseball so on and so forth a lot of good metrics out there that can help you like all right you need the for a hitter all right he's still barreling up pitches at a higher rate so i'll give him a chance or he's still hitting the ball hard or whatever it may be so uh yeah so it's kind of case by case basis but as i mentioned the, the hitters that have the you know the good contact skills and the good approach i tend to give a little bit longer of a leash to that as opposed to someone that like you know maybe jazz chisholm when he came up, had a, the higher K rate. Guys, you know, that worked out, obviously, last year. But guys like that that had the higher K rates or higher walk rates for pitchers, those guys, I'll be I'll, I'll cut bait a little bit sooner. Yeah, you know, great answer. I don't have much to add other than roll, roll, roll. I think it really depends on who they're filling in for and where they're batting the lineup, and obviously the pedigree matters as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything to add, Ruben? Yeah, a guy like, let's say you have you picked up Alec Thomas from the top, from the. Diamondbacks. He's been hitting and he's doing well right now. So you want to keep playing him, but he will hit. There always is that rookie wall. I mean, the only person that didn't seem to have it was Trout when he came up. He never hit that wall. He just so kept dumb. going. But everyone else, they always usually hit a rookie wall. I think Pete Alonso had it's. It, people call it the sophomore slump. It's they have a sophomore slump, but some some rookies just get it sooner, and you have to be you have to know when to sit and when to play. And sometimes you can just play like any other fantasy player and just base it on matchups. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and a, a term I've kind of come up with, uh, I call it the sophomore month sl- slump, where sometimes they'll come they'll come out and hit really well their their first month or pitch very well. Then that second month, when hit, you know opposing hitters or pitchers start to see uh, see these guys, you know, a second time or whatever, get get more game film on them, then they'll adjust to the hitter or the pitcher. Then that's their job to adjust back. Like, see Suzuki, perfect example of that. He came over was just absolutely dominant in April, and he's, he's hit a wall in May. Now he has to adjust back. So, But Thomas kind of falls into that group of kind of prospects I was talking about where he's always been the 
the high average, high OBP, good walk rate, solid uh, strikeout rate type of guy. Well, he's not the, you know, the flashy power speed type of guy, but he's a guy that I think will either maybe not hit that wall or at least not hit it as hard as others. And he's also a guy that I believe could like kind of bounce back, make those adjustments quicker and not have the prolonged slump, so to speak. Yeah, depending upon their profile and their contact ability and the ability to get on base, obviously they're they're going to be less variable during the year. They may not have as big an upside as some of these other ones, but they will be less bumpy in the road, as you might say. Absolutely. Um, time for waiver wire. Uh, let's uh, talk about a couple of waiver wire picks that you might want to pick up in your fantasy leagues for this week. Eric, do you have a couple of guys who you're looking at, uh, prospect or not prospect, uh, doesn't have to be for this uh, section, uh, take it away. Yeah, I got, I got two names, neither one of which are prospect, both hitters though. Uh, I'll, I'll go with the, the younger name here, William Contreras, uh, catcher from the Atlanta Braves. Now, he's a guy that was just kind of blocked earlier in the year, this goes back to what we were talking about with the role and getting that volume, getting the at-bats or the innings. And he kind of wasn't getting that, but lately he started to heat up a bit at the plate, and they've shown that they want to get him in the lineup here because over the last uh, handful of games he's been playing at, you know, he's kind of like their backup catcher to Travis D'Arno, but he's also gotten some starts at, at DH, which thankfully the uh, National has a DH now. This kind of benefits these types of guys. And he's also gotten a start in left field as well, which is kind of surprising. But at the same time, that just shows me, like, all right, they want to keep his bat in the lineup. Because like I mentioned, he is heating up. Uh, he's currently on a five-game hitting streak with seven seven hits in those five games. Three home runs, four RBI, five runs scored, and three walks. Had a pretty solid minor league career as well. 281 career hitter in the minors with a 346 OBP and an 18.5% K rate. Didn't have the huge power numbers, but he always was a guy that showed enough raw power. Like, yeah, maybe he's a 15 to 18 homer guy once he kind of settles into his major league career. So uh, if you're looking for a catcher and who isn't looking for a catcher, let's be let's be honest whether you're in solo catcher leagues or, or dual catcher leagues, we're always looking for catchers for the most part. So guy that's eligible there that also plays outside of, you know, out from behind the plate, you know, as much as he catches, that's absolutely fantasy gold. And then uh, Kike Hernandez, Boston Red Sox, who – Forgot how to hit for the first month or so of he the season, up. as did basically the entire lineup outside of Devers, Bogarts, and JD. Like, thankfully, Story's gotten going lately here as well. But he's really started to hit as well over the last two, three weeks or so. He has hits in 12 out of his last 13 games. He had a home run earlier tonight, which is now his second in the last three games. And the big thing, too, again, goes back to the role that we talk about. Alex Cora has could never stop showing confidence in Hernandez. He's still been hitting him lead off throughout his struggle. He dumped him a little bit earlier in the year, but he's been hitting lead off every single game lately. And that means you're hitting lead off in front of those guys. I mentioned you're hitting lead off in front of Bogarts, JD Martinez, Rafael Devers, Trevor story. So having those four guys behind you, you can just get on base at like a three thirty clip. You're going to score a ton of runs with those guys behind you. So a guy that can get you some pop an average that won't kill you. Some good runs scored. And the fact, the fact that he's got dual eligibility in most leagues at second base and in the outfield, that helps as well. So both those guys, you know, I looked over like over at Yahoo, for example, they're both like 25, 30% rostered, something like that. So definitely two guys that I would be looking to pick up this uh, this um, week if they're available and throw some some solid fab numbers at too. Yeah, I, I like that pick. You know, Kike Hernandez to me is the kind of guy that he always gets there. You know, like yeah. you, you can throw in, you know, 15, 20 homers and whether he's out of the gate and does it or then cools off or he does it in the end. He's just a guy that will get to his numbers somehow. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's like he, he it's like he dreams before the season. I'm going to do this. And however he gets there, he gets there. He's one of these guys. So uh, I do believe in him. And certainly if you're in a deep league, he's worth it. Um, probably wouldn't pick him up in 10 team leagues. But, you know, anything else. Sure. Uh, why not? Uh, and, uh, yeah, you took one of my guys, William Contreras. I mean, catcher, who has seven home runs right now, batting two seventy three, is a no-brainer in two catcher leagues, right? Uh, and yep. even in one catcher, 12-team leagues, um, if you're doing the streaming game, for a guy who's also spending time in the outfield and DHing, I mean, remember Eric Hasse from last year, although Hasse is terrible this year, unfortunately, because <laughs> I drafted him in a lot of teams this year. But uh, that type of thing where they're just finding at-bats for him, that that works in one catcher leagues if you're you know streaming or that kind of thing. So excellent picks there. Uh, 
hmm, I don't think Ruven's going to get my – or maybe he won't. Maybe he won't get my other uh, guys that I'm going to put down. So you go first, Ruven. Let, let's see if you steal my guys. Well, I'm going to take the trifecta on this because I was going to say William Contreras also. <laughs> um, and he's only 41% owned in CBS, and if it's a two-catcher league, it's a no-brainer to get him. I mean, he's, he's betting DH when he's not catching. I mean, he, it's a no-brainer. Brother of Wilson Contreras, so there's the pedigree there. So 100%, I agree with both of you guys on that. I'm a also a fun mention- little fact, too. Oh, sorry. Just a fun little fact, too. I just pulled up the the Rasball Player Raider. For catchers, Contreras is the sixth most valuable catcher this year behind going up from sixth. Will Smith, Jonah Heim, who saw that? Tyler Stevenson, Wilson Contreras, and then Dalton Varsha. So just a fun little fact there. Top six right now at the position. Wow. And and, the, and just happens to be in the last two weeks, Contreras has a 286 batting average, four homers, Eight RBI, uh, um, five only five RBIs because no one's getting on base in Atlanta right now, and he only struck out eight times. So that's so he's at a pretty good rate with that. Also, another guy I want to mention was having a very hot last two weeks. Also, since he was quote unquote sent down because he wasn't really sent down, but he was, is Frank Schwindel. He's only owned in about fifty percent of leagues in, on CBS, which I don't I don't get that. In two, he's the last two weeks he's batting two seventy five. He's got four homers. Eight RBIs. He's doing what he did last year. I, I I don't see why he would not do it. He just had a little slump. The Cubs sent him down for I think it was half a day. He didn't even make it to the minor leagues. They actually called him right back up with an, when there was a player injured, so he didn't get back down there. And if he's available in the league right now, he's he's a power hitter. You need power. Power is very quote unquote rare right th- this year. So I think he's a definite guy you can get. And another guy you should go after is a guy who's replacing a power guy, and that's because Hunter Renfro's on the IL. That's Tyron Taylor. For the Brewers. Last week, he batted 353, three homers, 10 RBIs. He's got playing time. Go get him. Yeah, good picks. Um, I, I was thinking about mentioning Frank Schwindel, but I thought he was should be owned already. So I, I definitely agree with the pick. If he's available in your league, no brainer. Uh, my two other guys I'll throw down. Um, you mentioned that power is important. How about Christian Walker? I've mentioned him before. He's still only 50% owned, roughly, in CBS. I know he's only batting 195, but 11 homers, 20 RBIs. He's even got seven doubles. Um, power plays in today's run environment. It's just a fact that there's less homers. So his output, despite the 195, by the way, since batting averages are down, that 195 is not like a 195 from four or five years ago or, you know, or 10 years ago. Uh, it doesn't hurt you as much. In 12-team leagues, he values as an $11 player. Um, and if he's on your waiver wire, why is he on your waiver wire? Now, talk about role with him. He's played in 44 out of the 45 games for Arizona. Out of the 44 games, he's bad at cleanup every single one of them. He's played first base in every one of them but one where he DH'd for a day off from the field. This guy should be universally owned, even in 10-team leagues, with today's run environment. So what are you waiting for? And I mentioned this guy uh, also a couple weeks ago. He's still only 35% owned on CBS, Tyler Naquin. He's got five homers, 22 RBIs, batting 262. So he's a little bit less uh, uh, one-category dimensional that, uh, as Christian Walker. He's a $13 valued player. He was originally batting like first or second. They moved him down to the seventh slot. Now he's back leading off. And if you're the leadoff hitter in a nice Cincinnati ballpark, that's sign me up. I think that if you're in a five outfielder league, he should be universally owned. Notice, by the way, I keep mentioning the batting order. I think that's very, very important. If you're playing in a roto league or in category leagues that really count or runs in RBIs, getting those counting stats is really important. And when you're batting in the top half of the lineup, top one, top one, cleanup, you know, whatever, you're going to get a lot of these stuff. So, Really, really focus on where the guy bats is my suggestion to you. Anyone else? Uh, anybody uh, want to mention? No, I think that's good. Yeah, good stuff. All right, let's do our pitcher preview. Time to uh, talk about pitchers who you might pick up this week. Let's see who the Pirates are playing this week. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll start with you, Eric. Who's the pitcher that you want to pick up right now? You know, there's, there's a lot of interesting two-start guys you know, this week. You know, I was looking at you know George Kirby, where he might have been dropped after the last couple of starts haven't been too great. Uh, he's got Baltimore and Texas in, in a two step next week, and that that's pretty that's about as good of a two start week as you can get. So uh, I'll def- definitely be looking uh, his way. Uh, another pitcher here that I'm pretty sure is still available in around half of leagues. Last time I checked, Drew Rasmussen, who has been absolutely 
phenomenal lately here. Uh, he's, he's been a top 100 pitcher, you know, over the last, really for the entire season. So if he's available in your league, I'd go out and get him. He just started yesterday. Didn't have the greatest outing. He gave up three runs uh, in five innings, but still got the win against Miami. Uh, and he's got Texas. Uh, and I, I got the right down the second pitcher next week, but it was a, it was a decent two start uh, guy as well. And then Cal Quantrill is another one who also has two starts next week. And you know the number it's been a weird year for Quantrill. Like the his ratios are still pretty solid: three forty two ERA, one twenty three WHIP, but only twenty eight strikeouts in forty seven and a third innings. Uh, he's shown a little bit more strikeout stuff recently. Um, he had five uh, in the start against Cincinnati, uh, but still not getting the strikeouts. But he's got a solid uh, two start week next week, starting with Kansas City on Monday. So uh, he's the guy that probably is the least rostered guy out of this trio. Uh, but a guy that if you need uh, need some volume next week, he might be a solid one to pick up. Yeah, Quantrill playing. Uh... Kansas City and Baltimore, so definitely are good starts for him. Uh, all right, Ruvain, let's see if you – I bet you're going to grab at least one of my guys. Go, go ahead. I don't think I will, but one of the guys I'm going to mention, we've mentioned on the show before, and that's Tyler Wells. I believe he should be lining up his two starts this week. Um, he's going to be facing possibly at Boston, who are not really hitting that well, and Zach Plezak against Cleveland, possibly. If he's to start, don't look at his overall numbers. He actually pitches better than those numbers look at look like. Um, he pitched against the Yankees this past week in five innings. He only gave two runs at Yankee Stadium, which is actually a pretty good thing to do. He's only 6% owned in CBS, which means he's going to be available on a lot of places. So he's pitching to a pretty decent ERA this year. He's at a 4-3 ERA, which is not bad. He doesn't give you a lot of strikes. Like he's only averaging like f- around 6K per nine, but he's not walking that many people either. So he's not going to kill your whip. He's a guy that you maybe had to squeeze a win here or there out of one of these starts just because he probably will pitch about five innings. Um, and the second guy I'm not going to mention is a guy we mentioned already in the first part of the show and talking about prospects. I think this would be the week to get either Edward Cabrera or Max Meyer, one of those two, if you have room on your bench because if they're available now, they're cheaper now. They're not being called up this week. And if you're being strategic about it, this is the week to get them because you'll get them a lot cheaper than when they get called up and then all of a sudden you can't get them anymore. All right. Well, uh, I didn't get my guys. I have uh, Rich Hill, who's 10% owned. He's facing Baltimore and then Oakland. Uh, Rich Hill usually does not uh, crash and burn. Uh, and he's got two shots to win. I know he doesn't go very deep, but... Uh, usually he will go five, or at least we hope he will. He will. Uh, Eric, what do you think? You think Rich Richel for your uh, Sox is gonna gonna get the wins there? I think so. You know, the Red Sox are finally getting it going here, uh, playing well over the last couple of weeks. So uh, offense is finally you know start realize they can start, then hit outside of the big three. Obviously, Story's been heating up. Hernandez, as we mentioned, Vasquez a little bit as well. So yeah, and Hill, you know. I, I will admit I was a little bit skeptical of, of the move. And it's like they brought in a lot of guys that have shown promise, like like Hill and, and Waka and Paxton, who hasn't pitched yet for us. But I was like, why are you bringing in all these kind of injured guys? Um, or are you just throwing a bunch of things on the wall and seeing what sticks? But yeah, Hill has just quietly been pretty solid. And you know, even at his, what is he now, 42, 43 years old, still plugging along with that mid-80s fastball. But, yeah, I think he's a, he's a solid arm in, the, in a good matchup. Yeah. Um, definitely. Uh, my other guys, I will say, is uh, Jake Junis, fifteen uh, percent owned. You know, San Francisco really is uh, turning it turns pitchers around. It's just something that they do. Every outing, he's been at least five innings. Lately, he's been six innings. Um, not fantastic strikeout numbers, but he has a two seven six ERA, point nine five WHIP, and his uh, Sierra, his uh, ERA estimators actually look pretty good. Uh, nothing seems odd. He looks uh, legit. So. Uh, I will uh, vouch for him. Uh, how about uh, David Peterson, who's 25% owned uh, on the Mets? Mets have a bunch of injuries, Scherzer, DeGrom, and so on and so forth. Uh, he's two start this week versus Washington and the Dodgers. I like the Washington start. I don't like the Dodgers start, but uh, it's up to you whether to play him this week. I definitely like the pickup because uh, he could be a guy who's valuable for deeper leagues in the future. Anyone else, guys? Yeah, I actually had two more names. I'll mention this really quickly. You know, Alex Cobb, uh, sticking with the San Francisco theme here, is a guy that the the just 
disparity between his like metrics and the surface stats are just astonishing. Uh, you look at go look at his savant page. Like, he is better than he was last year with the metrics. There's been a couple bad starts, uh, really bad starts, a couple really bad innings that really uh, ballooned his ratios. I think his ERA is over six still right now, but better strikeout and walk rate than last year, limiting hard contact well, you know, chase rate, whiff rate, all look good. So he is going to turn it around at some point. So go get him while his price is really low right now. And then another guy just to see if he's out there, Steven Strasburg just started a, uh, a rehab assignment, or he's going to very soon. I forget if he already had his first rehab outing, but obviously injured a ton, but still very talented when he's on the mound. So maybe he's a guy that you, if you get anything out of him this year, that's uh, an added bonus. But if he's still out there, I mean, uh, time is if you can stash him for a couple of weeks while he's getting his uh, innings up in the minor leagues, uh, it might, might be the time to do so now before the big rush to get him when he comes up. Yeah, Steven Strasburg, was. they mentioned it actually today, that he needs three more rehab starts, and then they're going to bring him up. So he's definitely a guy to be on your radar. Now, a guy I want to mention that probably, Eric, you know about, Matthew Libatore of the Cardinals. Is he worth going after? Is he going to be sent back down? What's the story with him? Now, I think if he pitches well, he'll be up uh, for good. Though, you know, I, I've never been super high on him. Like, for instance, like if you had to pick between... Libertor and like a Roanzi Contreras that just came back up with Pittsburgh. I'd go Roanzi. I think he's the better arm. Uh, but Libertor was pitching very well. He had a bad couple of starts to begin the year in AAA, but really turned it around over the last, you know, five, six weeks or so. Uh, he's a guy that can get you over a strikeout per inning with solid ratios as well. So, yeah, he's definitely a guy that, you know, I'd bring more. I, I don't know about 12 teamers, maybe, but more like, you know, the 15 teamers, I think definitely. Uh, worth a look for sure. All right, we've any time for your injury report. Who do you got this week? Got lots of guys here. Okay, <laughs> we'll start with Giancarlo Stanton, who was placed on the IL with an ankle injury. He felt some tightness in his calf. Is actually an ankle injury. Um, we don't know how bad it's, it is right now, but Miguel Andujar, Marvin Gonzalez will get some more playing time, and we're going to stick with the Yankees. DJ LeMay, who is still dealing with some wrist injury issues. It's some soreness. He had an injection on Tuesday. He hasn't played since then, so it's a couple of days already. So did you see who the Yankees signed and who is actually in uniform for tonight's game? Matt Carpenter. That's Matt Carpenter. Matt Carpenter, yeah. Matt Carpenter is back in the majors. And if you look at what he's done so far this year in AAA, Matt Carpenter has batted 275 with six homers in AAA with a walk rate of 14 and a K rate of 21, which is less than last year, his K rate. So he looks like he said he found something in his swing, so he's available. And, and if it, Aaron Boone said that Yankees call, uh, signing Matt Carpenter has nothing to do with DJ LeMahieu's injury, I highly doubt that. Chris Bryant was placed back on the IL with a back injury. Is he just was on? He was on the IL. He just came off, then he went back on. He was only off for three days. He's. I think he's going to be out for a little bit longer this time. Uh, Jonathan Daza is a guy who's going to get more playing time with Bryant out. Um, let's go with Willie Adamas, who was placed on the IL with left ankle sprain when he split in, when he slid into home plate. We don't know exactly how long he's going to be out for. Luis Arias is going to get more playing time, as will Jace Peterson and Mike Brousseau. Austin Meadows, we just got good news today that he's actually finally starting to do some baseball activity because the Tigers were very concerned that he was com he had vertigo, he had dizziness, he was lightheaded, and they were very nervous about that, but he seems okay, slowly working his way back into baseball shape. Dylan Carlson was placed on the IL with a left hamstring strain. Cardinals president of operations mentioned that it's a grade one or two strain and it's a sorry, grade one or two hamstring tear based on MRI. And they hope he'll only miss about two weeks. So grade one or two tear is actually technically a sprain. So he may only be out for a couple of weeks. So that's a good thing. This was breaking from today. Fran Mo Reyes was placed on the IL with right hamstring tightness. We don't know how bad it's going to be, but that may be why he's been playing so poorly recently. Another a pitcher now who actually hit the IL this week is Freddie Peralta, who has right posterior shoulder strain. Brewers manager Craig Council said that Peralta will miss significant time, but is expected to pitch again sometime this season. Yikes. Aaron Ashby should fill in, and he was also one of the prospects that was drafted in many deeper leagues this year. Alex Reyes, he's having shoulder surgery. He's done for the year. If you have him, drop him. Chad Green has Tommy John surgery coming up. If you had him in the league, drop him. Aroldis Chapman, he's on the IL with left Achilles tendonitis. We don't know how bad it is right now. If Clay Holmes or Michael King are available, those are two guys who may close for the Yankees. You may want to get them if they're available. 
Anthony Bender was placed on the IL with a back injury. We don't know how bad that is. The Marlins closing situation, it could be Cole Sulcer, it could be Dylan Floro, it could be Anthony Bass. You, your guess is as good as mine. So those are the injuries right now. It seems to me now that a lot of relief, relief pitchers are getting injured more, so there are going to be a lot of fab churning now with relief pitchers. All right, well, great stuff, Ruben, as always. And, Eric, fantastic stuff. Um, I mean, you are definitely the expert on prospects here and uh, really added so much to, to this. Uh, we definitely couldn't have done this show without you and want to thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I really respect both of your the work you both do, and, and this podcast has been one of my favorites ever since you, you started it. So, yeah, thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Why don't you just tell the audience uh, where they can read all your good work and, uh, and listen to you as well? Yeah, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at Eric Cross zero four. Most most of my written work is at Fantrax HQ. I do anywhere from two to four articles there. A little bit of everything: some redrafts, some waiver wire stuff, prospects, dynasties. It's a good little mix of everything. And my top one hundred starting pitcher rankings for redraft, uh, rest of season value every usually Sunday or Monday with those. I also do one article a week over at Fantasy Pros, which comes out on Mondays. A dynasty stock report. And kind of talking two. Uh, two major leaguers and two minor leaguers, one of each trending up and trending down for dynasty purposes. And then do the Fantrax Toolshed podcast with my good friend, Mr. Chris Clegg. Uh, we do two episodes a week, usually Monday, Thursday, but early and late week episodes. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit of everything. Just try, trying to uh, stay busy as much as I can. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Ruvain, why don't you just tell everybody about uh, you as well? You can follow me on Twitter at MLB Injury Guru, where I tweet out injury updates, just the ones like I mentioned, as well as a lot more. I also have a weekly article that comes out on Saturday that helps you for your fab the following week. And I also want to give a shout out to my son this week because it's because of him that I know a lot about prospects because he collects baseball cards and he's always asking me who's the next top prospect. And he keeps telling me, he keeps asking me, he keeps making me look up stuff. And actually, the <laughs> first person I look up on Twitter whenever I'm doing this is Eric Cross. And I actually show him that and he looks it up and then he tells me to buy the cards. There you go. Amazing stuff. All right. Uh, Once again, I'm Ariel Cohen. You can read my work over at Fangraphs, at Rotoballer, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at ATCNY. And, of course, listen to me right here on the Fangraphs Beat the Shift podcast every week. All right. Once again, thank you so much, Eric Cross, for coming on the show. And for all of us here at the Beat the Shift podcast, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangress. Follow us on Twitter at beat underscore shift underscore pod.